Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to our 2022-2023 rule and policy proposal discussion. Um, we've got a lot to go over here, uh, but first I wanna make sure that we properly introduce everybody who's participating in this, this discussion. Uh, the guy talking right now, uh, my name's Hunter Ford. I'm the current president of the NCDA. I am Dylan Greer. I am a previous captain of Ohio State and recent alumni. I am Dylan Fedig. I went to Grand Valley State. Awesome. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to start with is our rule proposals, which were voted on at this year's captain's meeting at uh, Nationals 2022 hosted by Western Michigan. Uh, once we get through all of those proposals, then we will then discuss our policy proposals, which uh, to provide a little bit more clarity on the distinction, rule proposals are things that affect the game within the game, so to speak. And so these are direct rule book type of policies that, like I said, are going to affect the way that games are uh, played, whereas our policy proposals are things that are more ancillary or outside of anything that happens physically on the court. And so um, we'll get, a, you know, we'll dive into it and, you know, discuss some of that a little bit more. But like I said, we're starting with our rule proposals first. So go ahead, Dylan, and uh, let's get to our first proposal. Yeah, I would like to clarify some goals that we have really when we're introducing new rules or updates to the current rules. Um, and three of those rules or three of those goals are one to remove interpretation of a rule. If multiple people are reading one section in the rule book, they should all understand it the same way. Um, if there is not an existing rule for something and people are interpreting it differently, then we add a different rule or add a new rule to um, clarify that so nobody uh, follows rules differently. Second rule is to make refing easier. I think that's obvious uh, why we have that as a goal. And third is to make the game efficient and fair for everybody. So keep those three things in mind as we're going to the, through the rules and why you would vote on each one in whichever way you would like. All right, so with the first proposal, um, all timeouts will stop a rolling clock. So the proposal here is that any timeout, whether it's a team a team timeout or an official timeout, will result in the quote unquote rolling clock to be stopped. Um, the way that it's currently written, so in the event that any team uh, has a four point advantage during a match, um, they have the option to uh, end the match right there. However, if the match is not called, then a running clock is automatically put into effect for the remainder of the time in the second half, and it won't be stopped until the expiration of time or when the match is called. So this rule kind of has some cons to it. Uh, specifically, if there are 30 seconds left in a match and you call a timeout, then the match is essentially over right then and there. Um, allowing this proposal to uh, become a rule would allow that match to actually stop if the game comes back within, you know, if the team down by four brings it back at one point and a timeout is called the match is not officially over so that team will have some more advantages in actually coming back from that deficit um, this rule could also be interpreted as you know if the deficit becomes within uh, four points again meaning that four point losing team makes it two to four or three to four whatever um, all timeouts would stop then as well and all stoppage of the game could stop but the advantage of uh, the disadvantage of that is to still give the team that originally had four points a benefit in in the rest of the match. So don't know if I explained that very well. <laughs> but yeah, so let's let's, uh, let's talk about the why this original rule was started. They you know if a team back in the day when the rule book was officially written, uh, like two or three point spread, there was no coming back. And nowadays we've seen three point comebacks last season several times. And so even a four point comeback isn't something that is just, you should just end the game over at this point in time. Um, so we're seeing a lot more, a lot faster points scored, especially with the 12 roster versus the 15 roster than we have before. So there's, there's several ways that we could, um, repair this rule to make it more up to date. And this is just one of the first steps to get there, I'd say. Yeah, agreed. I think uh, Dylan Greer, as you said earlier, you know, one of the big things is um, improving the efficiency of the game. And then piggybacking off of Dylan Fedick's point, 
I mean, we had, you know, we saw matches like at MDC when Michigan State overcame a three-point deficit to GV, you know, and came back and won there. We saw, uh, I believe, Bowling Green State was down by three um, against Penn State at Nationals and came back and won. And the idea of having something in place that would, you know, prevent something like that from happening uh, just because of, you know, kind of the way that the old game worked um, is something that, like I said, is is not efficient uh, to today's game. And so um, that's where we could see, you know, a big pro for this uh, for this going forward. All right, move on. Sure thing. Um, substitutions can only be made during team timeouts or injury timeouts. Uh, so the proposal is that only a team timeout or injury will merit a substitution. Um, the way that the current rule is written is that substitutions can be made either during team timeouts or an official timeout. And so really the reason that uh, this proposal will be, you know, is kind of in place and sorry to speak and steal your thunder on this one, Dylan. Um, but the real reason that this is in place is to basically restrict the amount of opportunities that a substitution can be made. And so you have a lot of situations that warrant an official timeout. Um, as an example, balls over um, shot clock violation type of situation, or um, if we need to, uh, you know, remove the pop ball or uh, things along those lines. And so this narrows down the focus and train and makes subs, you know, substituting a little bit more of a critical piece and have to be a little bit more strategically placed rather than something that can be done uh, more on the fly. I also think this removes the instance where a team could kind of force an official's timeout and cause a substitution. Typically, if a captain is arguing with the official for long enough, the official is going to call a timeout to stop the game and clarify something. So if a team really wanted to, they could force that and call a substitution to kind of uh, to benefit them. But this will, will remove that as well. They should have some sort of uh, punishment, so to speak, if they want to make a substitution. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I think that's a really good point there. Um, and in terms of uh, in terms of sort of, again, kind of similar to the last proposal where we're rectifying some of the things that just weren't as common with the older, you know, with the older game, um, you see that a lot uh, there's a lot more contingency on deliberating calls and making sure that we're getting, you know, uh, we're making sure that sequences of play are accurate. And to your point getting an official to basically, you know, use an official timeout in order to discuss a play happens a lot more frequently now than it did necessarily in the past. And so, you know, having sort of that open window where you can basically substitute penalty free just by, you know, trying to, you know, argue a call or bring attention to something um, makes it much easier for you to get away with, you know, being able to warrant your substitution. And so um, this, like I said, helps provide that restriction in that regard. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on. Required balls for tournament change. Um, I won't read out that whole thing because it's fairly straightforward, but uh, the proposal is that teams will be required to bring seven balls to a tournament. Right now, each team is required to bring five with the penalty being that a yellow card is awarded to uh, the captain for spend and have them spend the first point in jail. Um, since still in Greer, this was your proposal, feel free to chime in on anything else yeah basically it's it's self-explanatory a, a tournament is typically three matches long and your balls are going to pop at some point during that so if you only bring five the host team is going to be required to supply the balls uh, to replace the ones that get popped so if you only bring five then the host team is going to have to supply a lot of balls if you bring seven you're helping out that host team and they shouldn't really be punished that that much for uh, hosting the tournament and really doing all the work to bring those teams together um, there's also another proposal where the um, the ref is required to hold an 11th ball in case of a ball pop so they can keep the natural flow of the game going. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, allowing teams to bring seven balls will allow that 11th ball to be in play since now we have 10 ball or 11 balls being required at the start of each match versus 10. Um, just trying to help the, the host teams and uh, allow for a larger income of balls to each tournament. Gonna, gonna move on. <clears throat> All right, so this one is a little bit of an interesting one that I know that both Greer and Fedig have a lot of opinions on, so um, I'll defer to them. But uh, entering the court while holding a ball, 
So the proposal is that players will now be eligible to pick up a ball and enter the court upon re-entry from a catch, even if the ball they are uh, picking up is uh, currently out of play. Um, the way that it's currently written right now is that a player coming in from the jail uh, is not intentionally is not allowed to intentionally touch a ball before entering play. Um, intentionally touching or securing a ball declares that player live, but standing out of bounds. So therefore, that player would be ruled uh, out in that type of scenario. I think there's a lot of pros and cons for this proposal. The pro is that um, we could actually follow this rule. Um, because in a lot of matches this past year, this this has happened and the refs have not been able to see it, or if they did, they would they would call them out if they knew the rule. But uh, if we allow this rule, then we don't ever have to worry about a, team, a player coming in and picking up a ball before they go in bounds, and that's something that the ref would no longer have to pay attention to. Um, it, if this proposal passes, then we have one less thing to worry about, and uh, we don't miss any calls. Uh, there's a lot of instances where somebody picked up a ball and they were not called, and it changed the game. Um, some cons of this are if you're coming into play and you get a ball from out of bounds, you can have protection as soon as you enter the court. I know one really big strategy is hitting a player as soon as they walk in bounds. And that's something that you have to worry about currently. But if this proposal passes, then you have protection, which also isn't necessarily a bad thing, but uh, it's just something to think about how it changes the strategy. Yeah, you pretty much hit all the pros and cons. Only other thing I, I can think of is basically if someone gets a ball out of bounds and brings it into play with them, um, we might need to look at any kind of additional rules if they make a play or make interrupt a play or something before they become an active player. Like, what do we do there? And I mean, I'm sure it's just a, it's probably the, if we just tack it on to the like make interfering a play as a dead player, probably yellow card, but it probably would be something we should look into as well. Yeah, this is something that there's probably going to be a, a couple more rules affected if this proposal comes into play, but hopefully nobody really abuses the ability to pick up a ball before they come in bounds. And this is just something to make refing easier instead of making the game uh, harder to interpret. So. Either way, this this proposal passing could be good for a couple of things and it could be bad for a couple more things. Um, it, it doesn't change much. The, the biggest thing for me is that refs will no longer have to worry about this if it does pass. Yeah, and if you're the you're the first or the only player out, I guess, and you're shagging balls for your team, you get called back in while you're shagging a ball. Like, should you be out? No, that's that's pretty lame. That's that's so, fair as well. Yeah. All right, moving on. <clears throat> All right, so recently eliminated player may pass a ball back to their team. So this one is a little bit interesting. It's uh, in that there's no real clear. This is one of those ones where uh, we talked about beforehand where uh, a player's interpretation of the rule affects like how they would, you know, go about, um, you know, handling this in a game. So the proposal is that if a player who is holding a ball gets out they will now be able to forfeit the ball backwards in the direction of a teammate or their team's baseline um, in a similar fashion as the um, as the ball exiting within your team's zone uh, out of bounds uh, type of deal. Um, the way that this is sort of currently written out is that upon being ruled out, um, a recently deceased player should immediately raise their hand and leave the court in the quickest way and least intrusive way possible. Um, and so effectively, what we're saying here is that there's no real rule in terms of, you know, what a player should do with that ball once they're eliminated. Um, this is one that's sort of just been kind of like uh, discretionary uh, in terms of like a ref judgment call in terms of how they would allow, you know, what they would allow a player to do. Um, and having a proposal like this would basically help uh, eliminate any type of discrepancies there. Pretty much the hill. So then Again, the pro problem comes where what happens if they don't, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't, it's not addressed in this proposal. Like, what if what happens if for, they pass it forward? Is there, is that a yellow card? What happens if the guy doesn't know he's out and so he moves the ball forward? If that happens, we have ref's discretion on anything. So, if the ref sees that the, the player's 
causing a disturbance in the game, they can make a call however they wish. Um, if the player is not is really trying to just follow the rule, if they pass it forward by just a little bit, there's no way the ref is going to call them out. So again, uh, underlying rule for anything is ref's discretion, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. But we have had in the past people who follow the letter of the rule and say, hey, listen, there's no gray area. He moved it in the forward direction. Yeah. He should be, I guess, I don't know why he should be because it's not it's not addressed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, maybe, what... maybe we don't address it. Maybe that is the answer. Maybe we don't have a punishment and we allow the, that to be the ref's discretion because then the 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 guys can't be like, oh, he, he cheated, he should be out. Yeah. I think that these kind of rules players should follow as close to the, the way it's written as possible. Like if I get out and I walk over to my teammate and hand them the ball and then leave the court, that should not be the way it is. And since currently in the rule book, there is no official thing to do with the ball when you get out, um, you could do that. But now we have something in place, it's going to make it a little bit more, a little bit harder to do those sort of things. So like you said, people are going to follow, the, follow these rules pretty strictly as they should. But now that we have something written to clarify what you're supposed to do, all those other things should no longer be allowed. So in which case, will they still be allowed because players are going to ref to how they've been used to it in the past? And in which case are the refs going to become more strict and follow these rules specifically? I think that refs should follow the rules by how they're written. And if a player does toss a forward or if they do hand the ball to a teammate, they should realistically be called out or whatever punishment we may associate with this. So um, it does add a little bit of an interpretation there if it passes. Yeah, and I think one thing that needs to be, you know, emphasized here is that this is needs to be in, only in situations where a player is physically in possession of a ball. And so, for example, if a ball was laying right next to them, it's not a situation where once you get out, you pick up that ball next to you and then roll it back to teammates. It's only for, you know, when you're possessing a ball. Um, and that's something that teams will need to make sure that they're, you know, aware of um, when this is, in, you know, when this is in place. Um, I think uh, the you guys touched on a lot of kind of like the pros and cons and potential implications of calls. Um, I think one thing that, you know, this is sort of a, I think that this proposal is also sort of like a balancing mechanism in terms of, you know, whether you could say, you know, a team not being completely punished for losing a player in the sense of, you know, now that they have that ability to get the ball back to them, you don't have a situation where you have sort of a player where you could have like a player in the neutral zone or on another team's attacking line, get out. And now not only are you losing a player, you're losing a ball too. And so, um, you know, you could argue that it helps, you know, balance things out from that respect too. All right. So what happened? I have a ball, two balls in my hand. I get hit. I'm out. I go up. Oh, I throw a ball. Cause I didn't think I got hit. And then the ball's on the other side of the court. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, and then my team's like, no, no, no. He can only move the back ball backwards. So they are we going to take that ball from the other team and give it to my team? <laughs> In that sort of situation, I think the ref should call a timeout and clarify what all happened. If the player didn't think that he got it and he continues to play and then some other things happen, let's say that ball that he threw hit somebody, then the, the person he hit would obviously be safe if that player was out. So that's a situation right, but, where the ref is the stop ball player. Go? Where's the ball go, though? It should be back to the, the team. If he's in the neutral zone, you're saying? Yeah. I'm in the neutral go zone. Neutral I zone. throw a ball, but I'm already out. The only way the direction the ball should go is backwards, but I threw it forwards. I say the ball is placed in the neutral zone when play resumes after the official timeout. Mm, okay. <laughs> Because he's allowed to throw the ball backwards, but that doesn't mean that he has to. It will every single time. Okay, I like that. I like that argument. Cool. All right, let's move on. <laughs> no worries. Um, uh, balls over slash shot clock penalty change. Um, so the proposal here is that if a shot clock violation call is made, the offending team will forfeit all balls in their possession until they have two remaining. 
if the offending team has two or fewer balls at the time of a shot clock violation call is made, the no balls will be forfeited. Um, the way that our current rule works is that in the event of a shot clock uh, violation and a failure to uh, make a throw within the legitimate attempt zone is made, then that team uh, who violates the rule uh, will be forfeiting all of their balls to the non-offending team and each team's shot clock will be reset. So um, I'll let you guys talk a little bit more because I know you guys have stronger opinions on this than I do. Um, and you can go from there. Yeah, I think this is one of those rules where we really just have to see an effect before we know the full implica implications of it. Uh, this, uh, this rule is to uh, minimize the penalty of getting a balls over. If a team has eight balls and they make a, a throw that is pretty close to being valid, but the ref calls it a no throw, which those calls by the refs are up for interpretation. So then the, the team gets the balls over and it's pretty much the ref's fault or it could be the ref's fault. Should that team get penalized all eight balls for something that the ref could have called a throw? The, the idea of this proposal is to limit those issues where it's a pretty harsh penalty for something that you know realistically wasn't that big of, a, of an issue. Um, I think it adds too much complexity into the game. I think it makes the call more complicated and it adds too much incentive to not make a, a valid throw. Yeah, I think, I think, um, so there's two areas where I see this, uh, there's two areas where I see this being abused. Um, one is in sort of like a late time, uh, either half time, you know, either in first half or second half type of situation where you already are down to, you know, small number of players remaining. And so realistically, you know, let's say that you're a team with only two players remaining and you're trying to, you know, burn out the clock, so to speak. You basically put yourself in a situation where you only, where you're going to keep those two balls regardless. So one player is still going to, you know, be able to block with the ball and you're forcing the team to go back to the other side of the court and basically reset every single time. And, you know, that, uh, you know, albeit eats about three seconds of time, you know, going through there, but, you know, you are putting yourself in a position where they have to be continuously coming to attack you. And so, you know, that's one area where it can be abused. And then the second, which is, you know, kind of the same scenario more or less, but uh, within overtime as well, because this is a, the proposal doesn't distinct between overtime versus uh, regulation play. And so when you're talking about an overtime situation where there's only um, where there's only uh, seven balls to begin with, then, you know, the penalty of, you know, having five versus two is obviously a lot less stringent than eight versus two to begin with. Um, and so you don't, uh, you know, like like Dylan Fettig was saying, there's a little bit more incentive to just not throwing. Obviously, you know, we're coming off is a little bit more jaded against this. Um where, you know, you can try to counter it and say, you know, some of the pros for it, obviously, you know, the big, the biggest thing is, you know, decreasing the penalty of, you know, having a shot clock violation. And if you're playing against a good enough team, like a Grand Valley, like a Michigan State, for example, you know, a shot clock violation could potentially doom the point for you entirely. And so this would be a way to sort of balance the game back into, you know, the offending team's favor, so to speak, and that you're not getting completely, you know, you're not getting completely uh, thrown under the bus as a result of a violation here. Um, and so, you know, I would, that's the biggest justification uh, for the proposal. Um, I think that the other aspect of it is that uh, I do, I'll sort of contradict myself here. I do think that uh, it adds a little bit of complexity in terms of, you know, adding, you know, different minutia to the game. But it does keep a little bit of consistency with our current rule, which is that a team with two balls or less uh, doesn't have a shot, you know, doesn't have a shot clock. And so that part doesn't change, uh, you know, as a result of this and that, you know, the team with that commits the shot clock violation isn't going to be having a shot clock afterwards either. And so, um, you know, you could argue that it's keeping some consistency there. But um, again, just trying to make sure we're, you know, presenting it, you know, in, on, from both perspectives. Yeah, I think there's a lot of pros and a lot of cons, and we're just going to let uh, you guys, the member teams, kind of figure it out for yourself whether or not you want to vote for it. I think that either way, 
at the end of the day, is it really going to affect the game by that much? We'll see. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I, think, I think the answer there is yes, too. But uh, yeah, basically, that's, again, up for the teams to decide. <laughs> it basically will take, like, shot clock violations from, like, three to five a game to, like, 10 to 12. In yeah. I mean, I, I definitely I agree with that. But do you think that it's going to change the outcome of the game that much? It's going to change the the effect. Yes. But is, is the is the better team still going to beat the lesser team? Probably. Yeah, Essentially, but, you don't want to balls over anyway. Yeah. But if that's that's a bad argument for a rule, like is a better team going to win because of this rule? Yeah. Yes, but I'm like, just trying to move on to the it. next rule. Is is where I'm at. <laughs> well, this is, this is the biggest. This is the biggest game changing rule on the docket. So I don't know yeah. if we need to. Breeze. I think I did just think of another situation where it sort of can be abused by both sides at the same time, so to speak, and that could be in a scenario where teams, you know, are in a tie game with only a couple players left on both sides. And you're sort of more incentivized just for neither team to throw and just kind of milk it into overtime and basically, you know, sort of eliminates the need for any type of urgency to get that point in the game. Um, you know, I know that's a little I know that's a little bit niche and maybe some teams, will, you know, don't necessarily think about it that way, but it could, you know, that's one possibility of, you know, two teams that decide to just kind of take the safe road and stall out until, you know, OT, so to speak. So I was thinking, and there was there's like this weird situation. If you have four balls, right? Mm-hmm. You throw one, you throw one ball, and it doesn't count. So now you have a couple seconds to make a decision. Like, do I attempt to make another long throw that might not count, which could lose me, because then that would get me down to two balls in my possession when the shot. Comes. You just got muted, Dylan. Did you lose me for a second? You, yeah, you're good now, though. Yeah, so if I, so if I, if my third, if my second throw doesn't go, then I would go to zero. It's almost like, oh, now I definitely shouldn't throw because then I only lose one ball instead of three. It's like a, a weird, like, there's certainly no reason to throw this, this ball. Yeah, I mean, there's a, it, Definitely increases the incentive to not throw, which I think is a bad thing for the game. But uh, it also removes those long catches that teams didn't want to throw anyway. So if you have three balls and you don't want to throw that third one because there's no point because you still keep two balls, then you don't have to throw a 50-foot throw across the court that might float to somebody's chest. So Yeah, but why, why, why should we give someone – like a reason to be in a bad position when they had 15 seconds or 10 seconds to not yeah. be in that position. I, I agree with you, but I think if we're just going over the proposals, we should cover the pros and the cons to it so teams can decide on their own and vote. Because I, I, I agree with you that there are a lot of cons, and I understand you feel strongly about this not passing, it seems like, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we've pretty much drilled down every type of scenario or way that this either adds or detracts to a game. So I'm fine with uh, fine with where we were in that regard. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Next one is very not controversial. So uh, adding the addition of two back judges uh, to an officiating crew. So the proposal is that in addition to head, assistant, and shot clock referees, there will be a back judge added to each side of the court who will make calls and um, as an additional assistant referee. Uh, right now, there's no requirement for it, so there's no, um, you know, there's no rule necessarily in place for it. Um, obviously, the pro is that you have an extra set of eyes on the court, and they have the ability to make calls, and uh, especially keeping in mind uh, making calls on players who potentially step out of bounds and things of that nature. Um, and you know, it'll be a lot better in that regard. Um, you know, the one, you know, quote unquote downside to this is, you know, having to provide, you know, another additional referee, um, for a match, which um, two referees. means, or two referees, excuse me, which means passing, you know, two more people who have to pass your rule book quiz. Although 
I'll say that you guys should try and make sure everybody in your team passes a rule book quiz just so that they're know the stuff. Um, but where this could potentially be an issue is when you run into those four team type of tournaments um, where teams are, where you already don't have like an extra, um, an extra team to be able to help out with like officiating things of that nature. And so that's another person that you kind of have to have off your bench in order to make those calls. Um, so there's, there's that aspect too. Yeah. I think that as you, as the teams, uh, vote on this you need to think about the full implications of the rule so requiring two back judges uh, for each game means that those two extra players and two extra refs are required so every match that is played has to have those two i think that really the the big reason for this proposal was to encourage teams to think about having backline judges because right now in the rule book those are optional and teams don't really understand that in, in any single game they could have those two backline judges whenever they want to and if teams are thinking about that more as they play games throughout the season, then maybe we'll see that and backline judges will be encouraged and more often used more often, but requiring them for matches where we have a number one team versus a number 16 team seems like uh, it seems unnecessary. Um, in those close games, yes, we should have them more often, but requiring them just takes away personnel that we don't really need in, in that game. You should be having your fifth and sixth person on your team maybe think more about streaming and shagging for somebody rather than requiring them to be in the back line when they don't really need to be but this should be encouraged in my opinion and it should not be required Patrick, any thoughts uh yeah so like if you went to a tournament with five teams we have two games going on at once yeah that means you need 12 refs at one team needs to supply 12 refs at the same time. So we have teams that just can't actually do that at this point. Yeah, there are a lot of pros to it. Uh, obviously having more eyes in the court is a good thing. And a lot of people step out in the back line and the two refs can't pay attention to that always. Um, so, so I do see where the proposal is coming from. I just think that this is something that we're not there yet as a league. This this should be a requirement in the future, but I'm not sure if it would if it would work out too great now. I hate to sound too negative against this proposal, but I mean, that's the whole point of this is give your opinion. So yeah. All right, let's move on. I like how I said less controversial, and we had a nice lengthy discussion on it. Yeah. <laughs> I should say less consequential was probably the better word for it. Mm. All right. Uh, new proposal, though. Uh, assistant referees will carry the same responsibility as the head referee. Um, so the proposal here is, you know, in the name itself, is that the assistant referee will now be responsible for making the same calls as the head referee. However, the, the head referee will still be the final decider on a call. Um, basically, Currently, as it's written, uh, assist, you know, their whole point is to assist the referee in officiating a game. Um, I'll let, you know, you guys kind of discuss a little bit more since um, you both have a lot of experience when it comes to officiating. Yeah, assist the referees right now are required to assist the head ref and they are required to keep the shot clocks on cadence with each other, um, allowing the assistant referee to have the same responsibility as the head ref just kind of puts them in the same bubble, getting the game ready, hosting the, uh, the captain's meeting at the beginning of the game. Uh, it just removes that arbitrary line of assisting the head ref to you guys are doing the same thing. And these are the responsibilities that you both have all the way down. Um, it, it's kind of important to make the head referee still be the main, the, the final decider on a call because you can't have two people decide. And if you're 50-50 on something, then nothing is going to be decided at the end of a, at the end of a call. So this just makes the assistant referee a little bit more important and uh, hopefully makes refere refereeing easier all the way around. The other thing I'll add is that uh, since we also mentioned the other proposal about the head ref being responsible for holding on to an additional ball, this would mean that the assistant ref would be required to do that as well. And so you've got another person who would be um, basically being able to substitute a pop ball and stop uh, um, any type of stoppage of play. All right. I think we're good with that one, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, all referees may confer on a call. Um, the proposal is that regardless of refereeing status, whether you're a head assistant or shot clock, they are allowed to deliberate on a call. Um, as we, as our rule book is currently written, no official besides the head referee um, may basically uh, question any of the decisions made by an official um, who is executing, you know, their specified duty. So, you know, it's you know pretty self-explanatory, but um, as it is right now, basically, you know, in any sort of scenario, the head referee has kind of like the end-all, be-all. Um, and there's not supposed to be any type of stoppages of play, uh, for other referees to, uh, confer on a call. Um, and that's just kind of silly. <laughs> and so, you know, you want to make sure that you have somebody who's making, you know, who has the best eyes and best view on a call to be able to make that call. And so this just kind of like helps, uh, go towards that direction. Yeah. Right now the shot clocks don't have much, uh, much authority in the refing crew. So if a head ref makes a call on somebody that gets out right in front of a shot clock, the shot clock is not allowed to tell the referee that they are wrong. They're not allowed to change their mind or really discuss that call at all. So allowing this to change will give that shot clock the ability to give their opinion on what they saw if they had a better angle on that call than the head referee. Yeah, I don't really see any downside to it. Stoppage right. of play, maybe. Maybe. That already exists. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All um, right. Next one. Oh, I thought we had already mentioned it, but we here it is. It. We didn't. Got it. Uh, the head referee must possess a ball to keep pace of play to replace an improper ball. Um, so the proposal here is that at any given point in time, the head referee must have an extra ball in order to replace what would be considered an improper ball. So that could be a popped ball, one that's deflated, one that have, might have blood, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that way, you know, the pace of play can continue without a stoppage of play. Um, the way that uh, the rule that would apply right now is basically that um, any ball, um, any popped ball um, um, immediately makes that ball dead. Uh, the moment that it's popped, regardless of where it is um, on the court. And so play should be stopped as soon as possible in order to replace that ball. Um, you see a lot of scenarios where, you know, maybe a throw hits the back wall that causes a ball to pop, or it's, you know, sort of like, um, you know, out of, you know, a ball that could be like out of play or not consequential to play. And we, had, by rule, we are supposed to stop the game in order to replace said ball. And this basically would give us the option to be able to uh, bring in a new ball um, without disrupting the flow of play and being making sure that uh, the game can continue to move forward. So again, the underlying rule here is ref's discretion. So if a ball is popped in the middle of a play and it would change the natural flow of the game, then yes, the referee should stop the, the game to replace the ball and, and reset. But if somebody is picking up a ball out of bounds in the back line and they realize the ball is popped and it's not going to really affect anything in that moment that player can just toss the ball aside and the ref can give them an extra ball to to let the natural flow of the game continue um, a lot of times refs currently don't actually stop the game so encouraging this rule to pass would also um, kind of make things more consistent in the ability for refs to call the game yeah and so not that I've ever seen this happen in real life but hmm. it is the possibility that if I was just caught in, like stuck in the neutral zone, a guy is running on top of me, if I just rip my ball in half and then I'm safe, right? So yeah. I'm, so I gotta stop the game. <laughs> <laughs> You'd also probably get a yellow card for that, but that's know. beside it's the no, point. No reason to get a yellow card. Is the accident, right? I mean, hey, listen, if you give a if you give that guy a yellow card, you got to be aware that they have the ability to just like squeeze your head in like a watermelon. So, <laughs> so there's that. Um, yeah, I think I think Fedig brings up a really great point there um, in terms of like, you know, maybe intentionally delaying the game or things of that nature. Um, one thing I want to make sure of, though, too, is that you know, we're replacing the the idea of this in mind is for popped and deflated balls. If you spot balls with blood on them, you should probably stop play to make sure that we're checking fingers and 
um, yeah. that sort of deal so that nobody's uh, nobody's getting any unwanted blood. So keeping that in mind. Yeah, I think blood blood issues an official's timeout right away, regardless. Mm -hmm. It does, yes. Yeah. So yeah, maybe Anyways. we should clarify that on this proposal. Well, get rid of anyway. the blood part. Everything yeah. else stays. All right. All right. This one will be one that needs to be discussed discussed a little bit deeper. So um shot clock starts upon receiving a third ball change. So the proposal here is that the shot clock of a team acquiring their third ball resumes upon the death of the third ball. If the third ball naturally returns to the opposing team zone without being redirected by more than 90 degrees, then the acquiring team shot clock is returned to a non-enforced state. Um, the way that this is sort of the way that this is uh, ruled as of right now is that the shot clock is supposed to um, count if a team has three balls, by if the ball team has three balls or more, um, if they have two, one, or zero within their zone or possession, the shot clock is not in effect. Um, I'll let you guys go more in depth real quick, but the reason that this comes up is because you see a lot of scenarios, especially in games where there is a hard back wall, where a rebound from a ball rolls back from that from that team zone that may have only had you know two or one balls or no balls and so there's sort of that weird blur and gray area of whether or not uh, a shot clock should start when that third ball is rolling through their zone or whether or not uh, whether or not it should be treated as you know uh, part of their zone so that's the whole reason that this uh, comes up yeah so this proposal does two things the first it clarifies um, when the shot clock starts and it makes refing a little bit easier. And uh, the second thing is that it removes the ability for wall ball to resume the, uh, the opposing team shot clock. So right now the, the clock resumes whenever that third ball becomes, or it comes back into the zone and uh, allowing it to start right when that ball becomes dead makes it really easy for all the rule for all the refs to uh, start that clock at uh, a regular interval instead of waiting until the ball comes back in and maybe they don't understand that I know a lot of refs don't follow this uh, the right way which is unfortunate but this makes it easier for them um, the redirected by, by 90 degree thing is just so if, if you're playing wall ball you throw at the wall and it comes right back to you that's zero degrees if it hits somebody on the way back and it stays on their side, then the clock should resume right then. Um, if it hits the wall, hits somebody in the back, then hits their teammate, and then goes to the opposing team side, realistically, that should start their shot clock, but underlying rule is rest discretion. So really, this might be better as, as be better if it's worded as uh, the ball going back to the other team's side without them having any control of, of capturing that ball. Um, just again, two things, make refing easier and remove wall ball. Yeah, so this rule has been, a, it, it was a problem that we didn't know about before we did the, the uh, lesson three balls, no shot clock rule, right? So there wasn't, there's not really a clear line of when the ball, oh, the team with zero balls before would start, right? Reading this rule, your clock as a team, as a per person with zero balls, my clock would start as soon as the opposing team's throw entered my zone, right? If I'm reading it correctly. Right. Mm -hmm. So then that's before the other team's throw would reset their clock. So technically, if I have two balls, the other team throws, it's my turn to throw because it started, you know, quarter second before the other teams. This is just make it much more clear and more, way more fair and easy for the refs to understand. Yeah, in my opinion, if this doesn't pass, you guys, uh, you guys aren't riffing right, and you don't understand how much easier this makes it. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you know the clarity of like the ninety degree thing should probably be, um, you know, make sure that 
everybody's aware of what that means. Um, but other than that, I think it, you know, I think that it explains itself, um, you know, and yeah, I think this helps eliminate any type of, uh, you know, like you guys were saying, it helps limit eliminate any type of discrepancies and how, you know, that's called from ref to ref and having something more clearly outlined. So makes sense. All right, let's move on. Uh, this one's a simple one. The shot clock referee may call a false start. Um, the proposal here is that shot clock referees will now be able to make false start calls at the beginning of a point. Um, as of right now, only the head referee is allowed to make that call. Um, I think this one's a slam dunk because, you know, realistically having, you know, multiple eyes again, being able to make a call is, you know, the right decision. And so I don't have any disagreements or really any con to mention here unless somebody wants to come up with one. As a head ref, I would tell my shot clock guys, you watch each your side for false starts and then tell me. So I was basically bypassing that mm -hmm. rule that didn't allow them to call. But they weren't calling it. They were telling me. And then I would yeah. call it. That would just skip skips the middle guy, right? Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I think overall giving shot clocks a little bit more power is a good thing. Um, essentially you and your assistant ref could both just watch opposite sides and blow the whistle if you see a false start. But a lot of the times I'm just watching straight as the head ref because I don't want to have to turn my head and, and refocus my vision on the middle in case something happens. So this just makes it easier for the head refs and the whole refing team to do their job. Yep. All right, uh, next one. There will be no distinction between captains on each team. So here the proposal is that all captains on a team carry the same title and responsibilities. Um, effectively, what this does is dissolve the difference between uh, captains and alternate captains. Um, as it's uh, done right now, uh, players are designated uh, when players are designated at the beginning of the game with officials. Um, where a team has to have at least one player registered as a captain and uh, designate up to three uh, three alternate captains as well. And then additionally, one thing you know, kind of want to clarify that the slide doesn't show is that there's different uh, penalties uh, tied to whoever the head captain is versus the alternate captain, uh, depending on different situations. And so um this would like a like the proposal says absolve the idea of a sort of you know sort of head captain and alternate captains and so they all just you know carry the title of captain yeah to clarify this does not mean that teams are not allowed to have alternate captains you can still have captains and alternate captains uh, associated with your team however you want but as far as uh the ncda is concerned all captains have the same uh the same roles and responsibilities and all punishments that are associated to each captain are the same. It, a, a captain is not punished any more than an alternate captain. If let's say a team false starts twice, um, this just kind of makes it a little bit easier to ref and a little bit easier to award penalties if they may incur. Um, but you can still have captains and alternate captains associated within your team if, as you would like. Yeah, so this only really affects false start penalties and um, like team penalties, I guess, like your coach getting a penalty or a fan mm -hmm. getting your team a penalty. Is that the only two instances that it actually changes? Yeah. Um, go ahead. I can't think of, of any others specifically, but I know it does incur in the rule book uh, a couple of times. Um, Hunter, do you know specifically other ones that it affects? I can't remember whether or not technically only the head captain is supposed to be able to discuss calls with the referee. I think all, I think it's actually all captains. So it is all captains. Okay. So really it has more to do. It has more to do with that. Um, but there are also like, I think you, and I might've just missed it when you discussed it, but um, there was the uh, yellow card situation where it's a, um, there's effectively a hierarchy of who gets eliminated on like a team yellow card. Yeah. Um, and so right now the way that it's done is that the head captain is eliminated. It, it has to be eliminated first and then 
alternate captains are selected by the other team after that. In this case, it would basically just be the team that the team opposing the offending team would just pick amongst any of the captains instead of it having like a set hierarchy. Okay. So, so basically, this it just takes like four lines out of our rule book that people have to read. Yeah. <laughs> More or less. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then last one, um, change to simultaneous last players out. Um, so the way that this proposal is stated is that if the final players for each team get out simultaneously and it's not clear who is out first, uh, the players will reset to their baseline along with the balls that were in their team zone um, slash possession. Any balls that were in the neutral zone um, during the stop will be placed in the middle. Um, this would effectively be treated in the same way that an official's timeout is treated. Um, the way that it's currently written, however, is that in the event of the last two players simultaneously out, it is a do-over where all of the balls are reset to the opening rush format. Um, this would basically just eliminate, you know, the idea of uh, stopping play to reset, you know, balls. And like I said, treat it more as like an official timeout. The current rule is way cooler, but uh, it makes more sense for their proposal to pass. Yeah, I think I think basically someone's just going to get out on a run up on the current rule. And I don't think that's the best for the game. Yeah, I've never seen this happen, but in case it does, it's better to have the the rule that makes more sense in place. I think we should just move on from this one. Okay. Well, that was our last uh, rule proposal, so we'll move on to the policy proposals. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the broadcast, uh, basically policy proposals are going to be uh, bylaws that are uh, going to be within our constitution and are you know impacting aspects of collegiate dodgeball that are uh, not on the court. And it'll make a lot more sense once we go through um, once we go through these. All right. So the first one is a really big proposal, um, a change to the proposal to change the overall ranking system. So the proposal is to switch our ranking system from the um, from 100% Gonzalez uh, from 100% Gonzalez to 70% Gonzalez and 30% NHL scoring. Um, we have an article available online, uh, which we'll share again that highlights a little bit more in depth um, all the nuances and what this entails. But I'll give a I'll give a quick rundown just to make sure that we don't waste too much time here. Um, essentially, the way that Gonzalez works is, is what's commonly referred to as an ELO rating system, which is akin to what others might consider like a power rating system, where it's an equal exchange between teams when a resulting match is played. And so uh, what, however many points that a team uh, wins as a result of winning the match, Subsequently, the team that lost the match will lose uh, the exact same amount of points. And so the idea here is that you get rewarded and gain more points for beating higher caliber opponents. Um, and if you are beating on opponents that are lower caliber, you will lose, le you know, you'll lose less points. Or subsequently, if you lose to lower caliber caliber opponents, you will lose more points. Um, and so basically it is structured as a system that, like I said, uh, is more about rewarding playing quality opponents rather than uh, necessarily, you know, the total amount of wins that you rack up and that sort of thing. Um, where the 30% NHL scoring method comes into play, uh, basically the way that the NHL does their rankings is that uh, the outcome of a game results in a set number of points. And so if you win a game within, uh, within regulation, that is considered two points. If you win a game uh, within overtime period, or excuse me, let me rephrase that. If you win a game outright, uh, you're awarded two points. If you lose a game within overtime, you are awarded one point. And if you lose a game in regulation, then you are awarded zero points. And so what this is providing is essentially, you have a set outcome regardless of the opponent that you're playing. So using, um, you know, an example right now, if you have two teams that are 
uh, really far apart within the Gonzalez rankings, like VCU and Grand Valley State. Grand Valley State's victory, you know, if they win, uh, if they win five to one over VCU in regulation, they're going to be awarded those two points regardless, and VCU uh, will be awarded zero points. Whereas on the Gonzalez side of things, uh, what would happen is that, uh, you know, the Grand Valley team would be awarded very, very insignificant amount of points as a result of playing that match, uh, and VCU would subsequently lose a very insignificant amount of points as well for losing that match. And so the reason behind this proposal is to essentially balance the idea of playing quality opponents while also being rewarded for playing lots of different games. And so um, I mentioned that example before with VCU and Grand Valley. Um, Effectively, what this does for us is it prevents a situation from a team like a Grand Valley who has a very high Gonzalez rating from playing a very minimal number of games in order to preserve that high rating that they have and basically, you know, kind of force teams to be able to branch out a little bit more and to play more games overall because you are being rewarded for playing more games overall. Um, the other benefit of it is that um, it sort of helps balance out uh, some of the teams that uh, are on the lower end of the Gonzalez system because what happens is uh, you are not being penalized as a result of playing and losing to a tougher opponent because you're just given zero points. You don't lose any type of points uh, as a result of you know playing a tougher opponent, but you do get the added caveat of you know only basically gaining points as a result of playing. And so that's the whole you know that's the whole purpose of it. Um, in terms of sort of the pros and cons uh, that come with this, uh, like I said, the, you know, kind of through my explanation, the pro, you know, the main pro is by rewarding teams for playing more and more games. And so again, a team like, uh, you know, a team like Grand Valley right now doesn't necessarily have as many incentives to play games because their rating is so high and it's a, very hard for other teams to catch up. However, they get the benefit of, basically winning games and being able to, you know, accumulate points on the NHL system. Um, and then the other, you know, along the same lines where I think that the balance comes from in this 70-30 model is that there is more emphasis on the quality of the opponent that you're playing. And so, um, you know, it's not just a matter of beating up on bad teams and trying to, you know, rack up points, you know, from that regard. Um, there's also the Gonzalez aspect of it where that's still in place where you want to make sure that you're playing against quality opponents too, in order to, you know, help your rating on that side as well. Um, I think one of the biggest cons to this proposal is that it can be, it can be potentially damaging for isolated teams, uh, from a regional standpoint. And so where I think about this uh, being a negative factor is let's say a team like Nebraska, for example, who their closest opponent is University of Wisconsin Platteville, which is six hours away. Um, and, you know, it's sort of as a result of that geographic isolation, they've been very limited in the amount of times they can play throughout the year and the number of opponents that they can play as well. And so you have a situation where, you know, let's say a team like, uh, you know, Ohio State University, which is very centrally located with the NCD, within the NCDA, and has an opportunity to play a lot of different opponents and doesn't face those geographical restrictions, they're going to be able to rack up NHL points a lot more easily, um, as opposed to, like I said, a team that's a little bit more isolated. And so um, that's where you could potentially see a little bit of, you know, negative backlash towards some of those more isolated teams. Um, you know, that's one aspect of things. Uh, the other thing is that the, uh, you know, the Gonzalez system in itself uh, has been a very good, has been a very good indicator of, you know, predicting final outcomes for games on its own. And so, you know, you see a track record with a lot of, diff with a lot of nationals where once we get into Sunday bracket play um, at nationals, you see, typically see very few upsets um, on the bracket uh, once we get into, you know, like I said, the seeding play in the tournament style. And that's an indicator that the system is properly ranking teams where they, you know, where they should be appropriately ranked. And, you know, you can argue that that's, you know, a case for keeping it, you know, things the way that they are. Um, I know that I've spent a lot of time, you know, dissecting it because I know, um, I know, you know, the, where this original proposal came from, which was back in 2017. And, 
you know, talked with uh, Kevin Bailey and Colin O'Brien, who were the initial ones who uh, had proposed this. And so I hope I did a good job of, you know, explaining that. Um, I think maybe one way of diving into this is, Dylan, do you have any outstanding questions about it? Or do you have any, um, or do you have any thoughts as far as like pros or cons? Honestly, you said a lot, and I think that you made sense when you said it. Um, you, okay. Anybody that has further questions or needs to like think about it a little bit more, just read the the proposal link. We'll, we'll have this in the in the ballot as you're voting. So just click on it, read what Kevin and Colin said when they originally wrote this proposal to kind of understand it a little bit more. Um, we also have a a file that explains the Gonzalez, Gonzalez system and how it works if you need to understand that a little bit more and also how the NHL, NHL system works. So just kind of read it and understand it and then make your own decision on voting for this because I do think that this is a really good change for the ranking system. And a lot of people will just keep voting this no as it keeps being proposed over the years because they don't really wanna get into understanding it. And once you do understand how the system works then you'll you appreciate the benefits that it brings. <clears throat> All right, let's go on to the next one. All right. Um, change to tournament withdrawal penalty. Um, this one is pretty straightforward. The proposal is that teams may request a withdrawal from a tournament no less than seven days before the event and receive no penalty. Um, right now, the wording for it is uh, that uh, there's a lot of different scenarios, but the cutoff is 10 days. Um, the reason that I think shortening it, shortening it to seven days is appropriate is because um, you can certainly run into scenarios where you go to a tournament and you get uh, the week before and you have players who get injured or, you know, whatever the case may happen. And this gives you the ability to, you know, take those injuries into account and be able to back out of other tournaments without, you know, facing any type of penalty. Whereas with the 10 day proposal, you know, you don't have that given caveat. Um, I think the main reason that uh, it has been 10 days historically is because, the NCDA had, you know, humble beginnings with a lot less teams. And so backing out of a tournament was a much bigger deal because you didn't have the ability to find other people to fill in. Uh, whereas now that we've done a much better job of expanding and adding teams, um, you know, games are a lot easier to come by. And so it's uh, not as big of a deal to have uh, cancellations. So I do see a couple of cons with this. Um Right now, teams are required to submit a schedule seven days before the event. So if a team backs out on the day that the host is supposed to release a, release a schedule, then it, it kind of hurts their ability to do that. So we're kind of contradicting ourselves in the rule book or in the, in the constitution by allowing this to pass. Um, allowing the 10 days to be in effect means if, if a team backs out on their 10th day, 10 days before the tournament, then the host team still has three more days to complete that schedule. Um, if you are waiting, if you are competing in a tournament seven days before the upcoming tournament and in that tournament, you have some injuries that restrict you from going to the following one, then you have an excuse right now, the 10 day rule or backing out of a tournament. It's a, it's a no excuse thing. If you have a legitimate excuse, you, you will not be penalized for not going to that tournament, such as, you know somebody's car breaking down three days before and you guys not being able to find a substitution for that, you will not get penalized for that. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, right, Hunter? So I think, and I, I'm struggling to find it, but I think that we have, uh, there is, there is a caveat to your, to the scheduling point that you brought up that says that if a team, if a team backs out, they have like an additional 24 or 48 hours in order to adjust the schedule. Um, I'll need to find that, but yeah, I think that, you know, in terms of, in terms of, you know, trying to take care of any type of, you know, loopholes or discrepancies in that regard, um, you know, we can be cognizant of it. Um, I just think that personally, the idea of, uh, I just think that personally, the idea of like 10 days is a little bit of an excessive, uh, an excessive amount uh, given kind of some of the things that I talked about slash the realistic timeline of being able to make, uh, you know, a, a schedule for a typical tournament event. Um, but, um, you know, I do think it's a fair point. Yeah, pros and cons to everything. 
essentially for the teams to decide. So I encourage everybody to read the constitution and read this section specifically to understand how it currently is and understand how this would affect the game. Uh, essentially giving teams three more days to decide whether or not they want to go to a tournament is a good thing because if those teams need those three days and they actually go to the tournament because of this uh, lesser restriction, then it is a good thing overall. So pros and cons to everything. Let's move on. Yep. Um, next one is establishment of regions by the NCDA executive board. So the proposal here would be that um, an establishment of regions for teams must be uh, must be designed and improved by the NCDA executive board by August 1st for the following season. Um, right now, there is no such thing as regions uh, outside of just kind of like colloquial language that we use when writing articles and that sort of deal. Um, the main reason for this proposal is because there are other proposals that um, uh, I know one, the next one that will be discussed, which uh, use the term regions in terms of uh, stuff like scheduling for nationals or trophied events and things of that nature. And this is sort of a, uh, this is like a side effect proposal that would need to happen in order for those rules to be, in order for those rules to be enforced. Um, you know, in terms of discussing the pros and cons of it, pros, um, you can argue the idea of establishing, you know, some legitimacy uh, with regards to, you know, creating maybe rivalries or um, helping, you know, create uh, more structured scheduling throughout the year. Um, and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, cons being, you know, I think that regionally, the NCDA still has room to grow in terms of making sure that teams are, you um, you know, geographically well positioned to play, you know, other teams. And so, for example, you have a situation where on the Western front of the NCDA, where you have like a Wisconsin, Platteville and Nebraska that we mentioned beforehand, which are pretty isolated from each other, um, you know, situations like that, where we're, you know, where we'll need to group them. Um, that can be something that can be, you know, tough to establish, but um, that's sort of, you know, where my head is at in that regard. Yeah, I think that there's just a lot of pros here and, and not that many cons. Um, in the instance where a team joins in mid-season, their region would just be established when they play their first turn or before they play their first tournament. So if we get a team that joins in the, in the spring semester, then we will have the region decided before they play their first game. Um, that's the only really thing that's not covered in this. I think that we've always really had regions, but we've never had any official way to decide them. This allows us to have an official way to, to decide the regions. All right. Yeah, I mean, you know, to your point about always having regions again, it's been more of a it's been more of a colloquial type of deal um, when it comes to like writing articles or giving an idea of, you know, who's, um, you know, players, uh, you know, all 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 region, you know, quote unquote, all region teams, all, um, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of like other you know, pros and cons, you know, to this, you can argue, maybe it's a, you can argue maybe pro or not, but um, you could see a situation where there's a lot of redistricting on a year to year basis um, in order to, you know, fill in for new teams as an example, or if other, you know, if other teams fold and things of that nature. Um, and so it basically, you know, causes some changes into how, um, we look at some of like the more historical stuff, like all American voting, all region voting, things of that nature. Um, and that's, you know, one area that you can argue, uh, you know, kind of like either way, not necessarily good or bad. Um, another area kind of in a similar vein is the idea of breaking up what have been like traditionally, you know, certain regions, like for example, um, you know, the Ohio region now has, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, nine teams. Um, whereas, you know, our informal Michigan region has four, um, East Coast has six and that sort of deal. And so realistically, we'll probably need to standardize said regions a little bit more to be more, um, you know, equal in numbers. And that's going to break up, um, you know, that can has the potential to break up um, some of those more traditional um, aspects of things. But again, that's you can argue whether or not that's a con or a pro, just sort of, you know, kind of depends on your opinion in that matter. 
Yeah, essentially, as the, as the league grows, we will split regions up to be a little bit more equal across the board. But um, that seems like it may come in a later season. And this is something just to have established, which is good for we have that rapid expansion, which we, uh, we plan to have in the, the next however many years. Essentially, we could have an Ohio North and, and Ohio South if we get that many teams. Having nine teams in Ohio versus four teams in Michigan is uh, it's a bigger difference than expected at this point in the league, especially having so many Michigan teams before. So it could be a, a benefit to splitting them up, but um, that's something that we will decide on as we get there. Petty, you got any thoughts as the uh, as the old man of this chat? Um, yeah, I missed a few things, but um, no, I think I think it, August first is a hard date because we don't exactly know who is going to be a team and what new teams are going to be forming at the time. Um, but if we push it back later into the year, then it's hard to schedule regional tournaments too. So, yeah. I, I yeah. don't know what the pick. The date is a good point, especially having teams uh, join and drop out unexpectedly throughout the season, especially throughout the early bits of the season. Um, but that's something we'll just have to redefine as it happens. Yeah. All right, let's move All on. Right. <clears throat> um, so this is kind of why I brought up the, the you know, why the region uh, voting thing was sort of have to be a side effect if we if something like this were to pass. So um, the proposal here is that for nationals, teams within the same region can only play each other in round robin play if it's a mutual request between both teams. Um, the way that our proposal is written right now for non bracket play, which um, we established, um, is that. The, uh, uh, go ahead. Yep. You're fine. I put, I put a link in there. So I don't know if you want to show that. You can just talk about it. That's okay. Um, the way that it, the way that it works right now is that teams have the ability to request to opponents, and uh, we're required by our constitution to uh, give one of those requests, and then also, um, uh, you know, that along the like along those lines, um, there's no there's no limiting factor in terms of who you're able to request that's going to nationals. And so it doesn't matter whether it's an opponent that you've played 30 times throughout a season, or if you've played them zero times, if you request, we have, as the board, we have to grant uh, one of those two requests. And so um, that's sort of the, uh, you know, that's sort of the deal there. Um, and this proposal here would basically be eliminating the ability of, you know, teams potentially requesting opponents that they play on a regular basis if the other team doesn't want it. So any thoughts as far as pros or cons? Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a nice thing to add because if, if, uh, if I'm a team from, if I'm UNL or UWP and I'm traveling all the way to VCU for nationals and then I'm going to play three games on Saturday and one of them's against the other team. I'm and I'm not going to be happy about that. Like traveling half, halfway across the country and playing the team that I play every single time. It's not very fun. Yeah. Should we go ahead, Dylan? Sorry. No, you're fine. I, I think that there's a lot of pros in this. Uh, you guys kind of covered it fully. I hope this passes. I was going to say uh, a little bit of history lesson. So we dubbed this the uh, Rohan rule. Yes, yeah, so I was going to, I was going to say that too. Like uh, you can give the story if you want, but yeah. Um, long story short, way back in nationals, 2015 timeline, uh, there was a scenario where, um, and this is, this is, a, this is a little bit different because this was a result of um this was a result of uh, Saturday play, which resulted in Sunday seeding. Towson and Maryland were matched up against each other at WKU Nationals, and there was a firm disagreement from uh, from this from each side to not uh, play that game because they were 
you know, kind of the argument that Dylan brought up, which is why travel halfway across the country to play a team that's in our backyard, so to speak. Well, um, and I believe didn't they play on Saturday also? I so can't they, remember if that I can't yeah. remember if that was the case or not, but um, I, I think it was true. And so basically one of those two teams, whoever lost that game, half their games at nationals was gonna be against their closest opponent. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this year, this past year, what inspired this was um, with the result of uh, Penn State and uh, Penn State and Maryland being scheduled uh, against each other as a result of uh, as a result of request, and uh, one of said sides not being as thrilled about the idea of that having played them um, multiple times, and so um, I think that what you know trying to keep it from like a purely objective standpoint i think that the benefit of uh something like this is that adding a little bit more of variety and mixture to the scheduling helps improve the accuracy of seeding and so what i mean by that is if you're a team that's used to playing against like an opponent within your region um that's where that's what's going to dictate a lot of the standings throughout the year because those are the opponents that you're going to play more often but having, um, you know, having some non-traditional opponents helps balance out, um, you know, effectively, you know, situations where one region might be stronger than the other and making sure that, you know, we're getting the most appropriate rankings uh, possible when it comes to our um, bracket play for Sunday at nationals. And so I think that there is an objective good there, um, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, obviously the, you know, con that you can argue is that, you know, you're limiting my freedom and my ability to uh, request who I want. And, you know, you can take that for what it's worth, but that would be really the only, I would say the only objective, uh, you know, con from that perspective. Well, the other con, which I thought you were alluding to was that it limits your freedom as the historical creator of the tournament schedule. It mm-hmm. makes it, it makes you have a much harder job. So, as the guy that makes the schedule, which is a terrible job, he's pushing for this rule that that speaks volumes. Yeah. That also is a fair point. Yeah. There's a closing, closing thought. There is a con of uh, not being able to request some team in the same region, even if you haven't played them that year. So um, I don't think that Ohio State didn't play Miami this year. So if they wanted to request Miami on Sunday, or I'm sorry, on Saturday, they wouldn't be able to do that because they're in the same region. So unless Miami requested you back. Right. But uh, with this proposal, you can't request a team in the same region. So we wouldn't be able to play that team that we haven't played all year long. So in in a region that is pretty deep, like the Ohio region, there are some cons here. Um, I think that maybe this would be worded better as you can't request a team that you have played one time throughout the season or played more than once. Um, but that's, um, in, that seems in, impossible. Uh, what? Yeah, I would I would just add that on to it. If you have yeah, if they're yeah. in the region and you have played them, you cannot request them. Yeah, I think we're already past the point to propose that, but I think that would be a, yeah, good, a good benefit. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Uh, trophy event requests for non-nationals events. Um, so the proposal here is that teams must submit bids to host regional trophy events uh, during the spring semester to the NCDA board who will select the event location. Um, right now, there's no current policy on who is able to host said events. Um, it's just a uh, first come first serve basis. So Uh, For example, whoever hosts the Ohio Dodgeball Cup, Michigan Dodgeball Cup, well, Michigan Dodgeball Cup's always decided, I guess, well in advance, but Ohio Dodgeball Cup is, uh, you know, has traditionally been like a first come first serve thing. And one of the benefits of being a host school is being able to, um, you know, pick the schedule for an event. That being said, we did have a, we did have a policy proposal change that for trophy events, the um, executive board is supposed to decide um, the schedule and approve that. Um, and this would just go to another way of making sure that there is um, a sense of fairness and that it's not just a first come first serve, serve basis. It's making sure that the event is being held at the best location possible. Yeah, as a person, 
Well, as a person that's never had to deal with this situation, I think Dylan Greer should. I don't actually know what the process is for Ohio's Dodgeball Cup to select the, their host. Pretty much the first captain to make a group chat saying that they're going to host ODC is the team that hosts ODC. Um, there's <laughs> there's not really been many complaints from teams because they're already going to do it, so don't worry about it. Um, okay. We've never really had an issue with that. Nobody's ever complained to the point where we had a conflict. I just think that this is a little bit more formal, and if two teams do want to host – I think essentially you want to host the tournament every year because you have a lot of benefits from hosting. The only negative is that you lose a Gonzalez point for your matches, but hosting essentially just has benefits for your roster. So you always want this event. Um, so having a formal way of doing it, I think benefits the league, especially as we have more regions develop over the future. And eventually one day when we have an East coast dodgeball cup. Yeah. Whenever that happens. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I think that in general, my only, um, my only con for this is similar to what Fede had brought up earlier with regards to the national scheduling and that it's just something that's like added to the plate of the executive board. Um, and the other, you know, kind of aspect of it is like the reality of the situation is our board is always made up of, you know, either current players of teams or alumni of said teams. Um, and, you know, you could argue that the, you don't want to run in, you know, that it doesn't really change the scenario of people picking favoritism if there's, um, you know, a member on the board who has an ability to gain from, you know, uh, being a part of the scheduling process. Um, you know, that being said, it's more of a transfer. Of, it's a transfer of power in terms of who has the ability to, you know, potentially corrupt or manipulate a schedule. But, um, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, I, I will clarify. Um, in the original proposal, uh, it's actually the teams who will vote on the host based off of those submittals. So I think the NCDA board will kind of rely on the team's input of what they want and, and who they want the host to be. Um, so maybe we should clarify that before we, we put this into the, the ballot. So the executive board just creates a, a poll, basically? Pretty much. That's fine. Okay. All right, let's move on. All right, and then this is our last, this is the last policy proposal that will be up for decision, um, which is that the executive board is required to officiate the championship match. Um, Straightforward proposal, members of the NCDA executive board will be required to officiate the championship match at nationals. Um, currently, there's no policy for this. Um, historically, uh, the NCDA has required eliminated teams to ref one match in the following round after their elimination. Um, typically, the executive board has attempted to supplement the championship game with their member, with members of the board, plus any additional members that they feel um, you know, would be adequately um, and capably able to um, officiate. Um, I think that the intent of this proposal is noble in terms of trying to have the most neutral arbiters, um, you know, being responsible for officiating the most important match of the entire season. Um, that said, I think where we run into issues has to do with one, just the level of staffing um, in terms of the amount of people who would be able to help out in terms of officiating, especially if you have a situation like the backline judge uh, proposal, which passes. So then that results in needing six members of the executive board to be uh, available to officiate, um, which while we, while we do have the numbers to be able to do that, might not necessarily be the best utilization of our resources um, during you know, a nationals event if we need to have people who are focused on other areas, whether it be broadcasting or, um, you know, any other, you know, type of aspects of running the tournament. And then additionally, um, you know, I, uh, not to be a broken record, what I brought up beforehand, which is that, you know, we have members of the board who are also currently coaches for other teams. And so, um, you don't want to run into a scenario where you have uh, somebody who's a coach for a team who's being forced to officiate a match 
or vice versa, where we're limited by the number of people who can officiate a match because they might be coaching within a mat, you know, within said game. And so again, to iterate, I do think, I think the idea for the proposal is noble, but I think that in practice, it's something that unfortunately just doesn't really pan out in my opinion. I know I'm coming off really strongly against it, um, but- You proposed let, this. <laughs> no, that was, it was Becca who proposed oh, this. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, I think it's so, a good idea. If you All take right. this year, for example, you got Kevin and I, who were from Grand Valley, you got Rebecca from MSU. That's three eboard members that would have a clear bias in the championship game. You got Shadid, okay. who's, who's the only one who was qualified to run his stream. And we're also trying to supply commentators. And, and you're, you're also forgetting one Wes Peters, who is a Michigan State alumni Wes as Peters well. It's also a MSU alumni. So now we're down to Hunter and Peter, who Peter was helping clean up because he was running the event. So Colby and Hunter were would be the they would have to ref the entire match. Yeah, if I'm gonna be honest, I think that uh, the member teams that need to listen to this podcast in this part of it will not, unfortunately. So they're not going to hear the cons of this and this is going to pass. Um, so we'll cross that bridge when we get there the coming next year nationals, but there are a lot of cons to it. Um, but if all things go right, uh, the NCDA board should be hosting or should be refing the, the national event. And I think that's a good thing, so. I mean, I also, you were really not, that, not that this point matters, but I also don't believe in forcing someone to ref if they if they themselves know that they are a poor ref or they don't have a lot of experience refing. So there's another point. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that I think once we get to a point um, as a league where let's say that we have you know, a little bit more of a divert, I say diversity. Falling under the, you know, noble intent uh, type of deal. But yeah, Dylan outlined it very well there in terms of what kind of limitations that, you know, would have this year. I mean, to piggyback again off that point, uh, West, West, while he did a shot clock in that game originally it was going to be head ref, but it was, uh, but by protest of grand Valley's team, not liking the idea of uh, Michigan state alumni, you know, officiating during a match, you know, they requested to have a refereeing change, which resulted in me refereeing, you know, being the head ref for the match. Um, and so that was, you know, something that we had already run into in that regard. Um, I know we're harping on, I know we're harping on this a lot. Um, it's just, you know, want to make sure that kind of like the, you know, everything is laid out here since this is the yeah. last thing that we had to discuss. I hope the people that are listening to this are on two times speed. And uh, that's our last proposal. Yep. So right. thank you guys for uh, watching and tuning in. I know that we went into a lot of depth, but we want to make sure that we're providing you guys with the most accurate uh, information and understanding for kind of where some of our more experienced members uh, view some of these proposals. Obviously we have our own preferences and biases, but we will you know, hope that we did a good job of making sure to try and outline some of the pros and cons uh, that we you know, saw to these proposals. Uh, make sure that you guys are on the lookout for your ballots uh, because those will be coming out to you very shortly after this and good luck with your voting. Thanks for listening guys and girls. Yikes. <laughs>